Welcome everybody to the Magic Box Talk Show. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Applause. Okay. Uh, so we're here right now at the the Fun City Store, the Dollar City Store. I think we're, I think it's being phased from Dollar City to Fun City so that we can accentuate, emphasize the fun part of it. But it's a it's a very fun <laughs> store as you can see, and a uh, uh, wonderful place. It's very nice of them to host the talk show here and uh, kind of an endless treasure trove of uh, donkeys and things of that nature, uh, strange little knickknacks and, and things that are useful as well. So I am Colin Campbell Clyde. Hi everybody. And uh, yeah, oh, oh, oh. round of applause, Colin. <laughs> uh, applauding for myself. And now we have you are our co-host, yeah, Danica, Danica DeFoy. Hello who, everyone. <laughs> Who I happen to think is brilliant, and who used to have a wonderful radio show, but it just went away somehow. I don't know how that happened. I think that too. That's such a I, isn't that such a strange thing? <laughs> Anyhow, and we have our guest for the day, and uh, your name is Andy Couturier. 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 So someone in your Ancestry designed clothing then. That's probably a good That's surmise. That's probably how it came from. <laughs> I'd position see. a guess. The well. guess making mind is reaching for some reason. Dude, yeah. That. Uh, so hey there, and that was even an educated guess. Yeah. I knew enough French to figure that out. That's <laughs> right. So, Andy, uh, what you do around town that you seem to be well known for, you've uh, brought some uh, people to be here in the audience right off camera for those of you who are on YouTube but they really are there we promise uh, yay see you can hear them yay uh, alright so these are people from your writing class that's what you do you teach writing I teach writing and in fact these particular students not only are learning writing but they're learning to teach writing they themselves will be certified writing teachers Correct. after they're done with yes, your class. Yes, a six-month so, program. So. so you're not just hogging all the writing teaching to yourself. You're <laughs> exactly. spreading it around. You figure the more people know how to write, the better off we are as a civilization. Uh, you know, a lot of writing teaching is pretty punishment-focused, right? <laughs> right. You know, slap you on the back of the hand, you didn't do that right, it's incoherent, it's, um, it's jumbled, what's your main point, you know, know what you, you know, all of this is very sort of directive and, you know, there's a right way to do it, and you just learn the rules and sit down and get busy and stop smiling, you, then you will like... Do you flog people in the process? So that's what I, I found, <laughs> I'm resisting. Okay. So oh, we're more you know, about other college. direction. We're yeah, yeah, about right. pleasure, enjoyment, <laughs> laughter, right. experimentation, <laughs> making mistakes, and that we believe that. And the, having a good time with it all in the process. The subconscious yeah. mind will naturally bubble to the surface, and writing will be better on its own because it wants to come out in complex and interesting and. <laughs> rich ways. Well, the subconscious mind is complex and interesting and rich. And uh, so you bring that up. That's the title of one of your writing courses. Yes. Is writing from the subconscious writing mind. Writing from the subconscious mind. Excellent. Excellent. So what what would that mean, to write from the subconscious mind? Is that, so uh, you know how they usually say, know what you want to say mm -hmm. before you write it. Yeah. Right? Think about it and plan it all out and, you know, write about what you know. Writing so from the subconscious mind. Writing would from be the subconscious mind around. is one of the courses we teach, and that's about don't know what you're going to write before you write. Let's see what happens when we get out of our own way. And you know how you have a dream and there's sort of a strange elephant there and it's riding a skateboard <laughs> and it's uh, somehow. You don't stop to ask, Hey, does this make sense? Is this literary enough? Is this a enough? symbol right. of, <laughs> is you the, know... What's the donkey doing here? You know, is right. this coherent? That it just naturally bubbles up like the logic of dreams. But usually we think that has to happen in dream time. So what we do is it's not the unconscious mind, it's the subconscious mind. So it's kind of in between the conscious mm -hmm. and the uh, unconscious mind. And so we play lots of games. So we're really uh, ludic, which is a word I've been using, L-U-D-I-C, which means just playful. It's the sense like of that. like, you know, and I loved seeing, I checked out your YouTube clips oh, recently and I was you. like, that guy is all about play <laughs> and, and having fun. fun. Exactly. So what we fun. do is free writing. If which you want to come have fun with me, you're welcome to. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> to, to anybody watching in the audience. So the center, uh, is called, the center is called The Opening, right? And 
so it's about opening yourself up to whatever comes out and not evaluating it, not judging it, not trying to make it into uh, something that it doesn't want to be. And so we do lots of free writing exercises that help you get out of your own way. Um, and sometimes we do scrambling and splicing your words together. Sometimes you sh uh, take uh, an index card that someone else wrote some words on and they hand it to you and you uh, incorporate that into what you're writing and sometimes we use movement and the body in order to access the subconscious mind. Sometimes we go out into nature, writing in nature, the natural world is mm. another way to access Excellent. the subconscious mind and then you get to read it if you want to back and get uh, not just feedback, not just supportive feedback, but you know what happened to the subconscious mind of the people who were listening. Hmm, that sounds really fascinating and a lot of fun. Now you said there's a center. The opening yes. is a center. Yes. It's not just a class. It's not just a concept. It's an actual. Yep, we have a location in space, um, near the Goodwill on Squid Row. Squid Row, Row which Squid Row. which people who live in Santa Cruz will probably be familiar with, and everybody else will see. What what are they talking about? But Squid Row is a quaint little alley yes, that has some shops tree. in it and a willow tree. This is true. This and is true. It's a high ceiling, old Victorian building, and it's um. We do small classes there, and uh, we did the we do the teacher training there as well. We do the book completion group there. We do the creative nonfiction course there. So. But you also teach classes up in the Bay Area. I do. So I started teaching. I've been doing this for 15 years, and so I went to school here in the 80s, and then moved away. Lived in Japan for a long time. We can talk about that later. And then came back to the Bay Area, and I still have a pretty big client base there. So on Mondays, I teach in Oakland near Telegraph and Alcatraz. Oh, excellent! Yeah. Very good. Very good. So you get kind of a variety of people from different locations. Oh, real yeah. variety. Yeah. It's amazing. I've Absolutely. got kids and people with PhDs oh, wow. and uh, people of different backgrounds and ages and sometimes people are writing very serious things about life and death and sometimes people are writing goofy stories, psychedelic stories and sometimes oh, people are writing about uh, loss and grief and everyone's in the same room together and sharing uh, what their experience is of being a writer, what the journey, internal journey is of writing. Sounds like that would be a, a really rewarding experience for a lot of people and uh, you're... Maybe even for you. I, I'm, I think I'm going to take one of your classes, absolutely. Yay. Yeah. Oh. Yay. Yay. Um, so what do you and you're you're fortunate, hang on, you're fortunate to be in the... <laughs> it's starting already. Oh, the show here, thank you very yes. much. Uh, no, um, well, we're you're fortunate to be the in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Bay Area, yeah. which is such a sprawling megacity, I think, that if you uh, count Oakland and Berkeley, mm -hmm. and San Francisco, Silicon Valley, almost all as one big city, uh, it gives you a really diverse population. Mm -hmm of people to draw from, like you were saying, people from all walks of life, different backgrounds, uh, that sort of thing. So on to, um, boy, what do I write? I, uh, and what this- What would you like to write? What are you dreaming of writing? What's sort of like the thing that if you really could do it, you would write? That's a very good question. Uh, what, I, what, what I was gonna say is I really wanna take your class because what I tend to write is fragments. Uh huh. And so that's kind of the stage that I'm at in my writing is figuring out like how do I take these fragments and make them into a more coherent whole. Uh, <laughs> There's a little softball pitch right, right. right into my <laughs> There you go. Uh, put them next to each other. That's a good one. In a sequence even? In a sequence. Whoa! I did my master's <laughs> right? thesis yeah. on sequence. Oh fascinating. Very fast. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well you know I've been uh, watching a lot of film especially mm -hmm. but also paying atten attention to books I read but film in particular and really trying to kind of absorb uh, what it is that makes a story structure mm -hmm. work. And so now when I watch a movie, I don't just kind of passively yeah. enjoy it. I'm actively analyzing like, okay, they do these kinds of things in Act 1, these kinds of things in Act 2, these yeah, kinds of things notice, in Act 3. Yeah, what do you notice, actually? Tell us. Uh, I notice that a lot of it has to do with establishing a fact Mm -hmm. and then referencing back to it mm -hmm. later on in as the course of the story unfolds. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that's that's a major thing that a lot of writers do. I've noticed that uh, it's important to have have mystery mm -hmm. and then mystery, yes. have a reveal. Right. That uh, is you know what 
and solve the puzzle for the audience. Show the audience, like, oh, here's what's actually been going on the peak mm -hmm. of this the whole time. Right. That, <laughs> that you didn't have the whole picture until until we revealed these particular facts to you. Yeah. So that uh, Sherlock Holmes would be sort of the classic example of stories that are structured in that way. We give you little bits and pieces at a time and then as the plot comes to its culmination we start to fill in the big picture nice. and say hey this is what's actually been going on. That's exactly what I teach. So here's, <laughs> here's, a, here's a couple of quotes for you um, that I use in my class. Text structure, that is like how you put something together, uh -huh. is about the arousal and fulfillment of desire. That sounds kind of sexy. Yeah. yeah. It's about the arousal and fulfillment of desire. <laughs> and desire, uh -huh. this is the second quote, desire is the presence of an absence. Ooh. Negative so, space. Negative space, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So basically you have, uh, you create what you called a mystery. You created a reason for people to keep turning the pages. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a mystery story is a perfect example, mm -hmm. but lots of books. You keep reading them because you want to find out what happens next. So mm -hmm. as you put your fragments together, you want to create absences or create uh, this desire to read forward but you have to fulfill them right if it's all questions right yeah people also put that down right but if it's all tied up they also put that book down so you got to have this kind of balance between arousing the desire of the reader uh -huh. and fulfilling it as you go along but arousing more desire it's also almost kind of a leapfrogging mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and absolutely we actually use a metaphor <laughs> From strangely, from <laughs> you writers in your metaphors, <laughs> flower arranging, Japanese oh, yeah. flower okay. arranging. Okay. So, uh, if you know Ikebana, have you heard of Ikebana yes, at all? So, yes. Ikebana is different. I mean, how would you describe it as different from like a Western flower arrangement? I would say it's it's more minimalist. Uh -huh. It's more uh, focused on the negative yeah. space. Negative space. Yeah. Yeah. Stark. Yeah. Stark. And a lot. Um, they seem to actually use like rock as um, a lot more of the green space in, the, in their landscape as well, but right. I don't know, I love the Japanese garden in um, Portland, right. have you ever seen yeah, it? Yeah, I actually yeah. gave a lecture up there last year. Oh, I love it, yeah, I like to take photos there, it's awesome. So how do you create that negative space in your writing? So we use this metaphor from uh, Japanese aesthetics, from whether it's Japanese rock gardens or Japanese flower arrangement, that not only is there more blank space, but there is, here's one of my keywords, asymmetry. Mm -hmm. There's it's not sort of, you know, in a Western flower arrangement, everything has to be exactly the same, and if there's a blank spot, you have to fill it in. And that's the way a lot of Western writing is. And that's not necessarily bad, but we also want to give room for the reader themselves to participate in the act of creating meaning. It's not just mm -hmm. all up to the writer. So I was joking, but also said, you know, put your <laughs> fragments together. Put them together using the creativity that you use when you were writing the fragments using your creativity to put the different fragments together in different ways mm -hmm. that creates blank space, that creates empty space, it creates suppositions for the reader. Mm -hmm. Well, to what you're talking about with the, the blank space between the ideas, I think yeah. in film, that really shows up in the form of the edit. Hmm, exactly. Because when right. you have one shot where one thing is happening, another shot where another thing is happening, that split second where there's a jump yes, in between... that juxtaposition. The, <laughs> the viewer has to fill in that transition in their mind. Right. So that's something that is not what's being shown on the screen, right. but it's the interpretation exactly. that uh, is going on in the mind of the audience. And if the jump is too close, it's kind of boring. You're like, oh yeah, I knew that was going to happen. Yeah. If it's too far away, it's like, huh, why did that too happen? Too jarring. Right. Right. So yeah. it's actually, that's your artistry, or one of your levels of artistry. This is only one of the things we do at the opening, but you know, this is this you know, juxtaposition, putting things together with a lot of blank space. And the idea is it's actually more generous, more generous to the reader because they to get give to, them more to give them more of an experience of creating, right, right, as opposed to just sort of force feeding them and stuffing them with yeah. facts and ideas. I was thinking of mixed medium because you said yes. that, because mm -hmm. the different rock patterns, and I was thinking of the garden, and I think that's a really cool um, way to do that. How do you think the internet has affected the way people are writing? And do you think Ooh, it's good, good or question. bad? Oh, do yeah. I think it's good or bad? Yeah, in oh. your opinion, because of course it's, it's up to debate. But <laughs> well, I'll start with a with a funny line that you know, finishing your book is one percent okay. inspiration and ninety nine percent ignoring the internet. <laughs> <laughs> That's I don't think oh I could do God. that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think I think there's more um, tolerance for jump cuts. There's more tolerance for um, dis 
associated pieces coming next to each other, but I think also we're so used to the kind of smithereens that sometimes it just becomes confetti and it sort of falls apart. So right. I think that there's also a real place for narrative and for story building and not just having everything totally random. Mm -hmm. So that that's what I meant by having those chunks close enough <laughs> that there's some, you know, sense that there's some reason why they're going together. Yeah. So. We have Isaac out here. I know you guys can't see him, but okay. he's out there. Maybe he'll We're come in. Maybe he'll hello. come in. <laughs> so, what are Those you, of you what watching on YouTube will just have to take our word for it. You have to imagine in your mind that there's an <laughs> Isaacness. There are there. things that exist on the other side of the edge of the screen over there and the other side of the edge of the screen and over the negative there. Space. And we can see them. But so, Danica, what, what kind of stuff do you write? Or what would you like to write? Um, I like to write, well, I usually just collect information and write tidbits about mm -hmm. it so I can pass on the information. And I used to write a lot of articles um, and put them on like current.com or something like that. But recently I haven't really been writing that much. So, Do you have something you want to write? Um, I like to do more visual images, but maybe I was thinking of writing something on the Occupy maybe. Okay. But, yeah. What do you want to say? Something about? journalistic. Um, well, what hasn't been said about Occupy? Uh, there's a lot of stuff to say about Occupy, but I think I would write more about my personal journey in Occupy because nobody else has been through that. But right. I think um, it's worth telling, and I think a lot of people would be interested. But again, it's hard to want to put that down and then convey what you want to convey, especially um, because of the different languages and the different levels of education. Like That's one thing I found in Occupy that the level of information, it's really hard to convey to certain people if you maybe have different information than them to mm -hmm. have the same kind of communication. So I guess that's just part of the challenge in writing or being a professional writer anyways. Because oh. you can write any time. <laughs> Well, I think imagery is a really great way to start, is to show pictures, and I think that people, you know, pictures in your words, is, yeah. and you said you're interested in imagery anyway, so to bring your artistic training to that, mm. right, and so just um, creating imagery, and then if you want to ratchet it up in terms of vocabulary yeah. or something like that, you can link that together, but as long as you're taking care of the, the low information people as well. Mm -hmm. It's really about care. Yeah, exactly. And being like, um, what is it, your demographic, knowing the demographic, does that really matter to you as a writer or you just write for yourself more? Or? Uh, all writing is great. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes, mm -hmm. I mean, we also think, I think we tend to think a little too narrowly sometimes mm -hmm. about what's possible. Yeah. You know, for people, they may not have gone to college, but, mm -hmm. you know, actually yeah. there's, um, you don't have to. Well, there's different styles of writing, you know, because some of the classic American writers haven't been, you know, like that we think of. I can't really think that had, you know, maybe a Harvard education, but. So I just used the word ludic, you know. Okay. I just I made a choice to <laughs> like use this word. weird word, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, to yeah. play with things. It's not like a common word, but I sort of, you know, brought us. I'm going to use a weird word, and then I used the word ludic, and then I like kind of explained it, and now it's sort of part of the conversation. So I, I think that's part of the way you can do it, mm. but. Um, I think it's really just basically about caring. Mm -hmm. Caring about what you're writing Caring about. for people, actually yeah. caring for the people, because you're basically yeah. trying to give them something generous, right? It's mm -hmm. not just about yourself. Although yeah, I write for myself all the time, too, and I write parodies and farces. I write very serious pieces, so just yeah. you know, having more variety, and then you can... Um, so I want to pick yes. up on what we were uh, saying about imagery, and yes. that you're interested in imagery in your writing. I think mm -hmm. uh, one thing I really love about images and uh, visual artwork mediums is that I think that uh, images sort of uh, go under the radar of people's assumptions or ideology, preconceived notions. Mm -hmm. uh, images kind of go straight to that emotional core of your brain. And uh, in relation to writing about something like Occupy, Occupy is such a politicized topic that the moment you say the word, everybody in the room has an opinion about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, do they have the information, though? Because our, like, out of this room, I would say, I think I know two people that are occupiers, or maybe ten people, so I'd say they have the actual information and experience about it, but the other people have heard about it, so it's well, the difference say. between first half, right. and first hand experience and reading yeah. about it in the newspaper or something yeah. like that. But most people know what Occupy is, right? And you can get a pretty good read on kind of the political demographics of different people just by asking the question, What do you think about Occupy? Mm -hmm. So, anyhow, my point in all this is that I think that um, using a lot of uh, really strong imagery, mm -hmm. uh, really emotionally evocative 
language in your writing could be a good way to present Occupy in such a way that uh, people feel like they can relate with it and have empathy to it instead of just thinking of, about it as this theoretical political thing what that if? goes on in the newspapers that, oh, I've already decided uh, what I <laughs> so think about way. it because I heard from Sean Hannity or because I heard from Glenn Greenwald, you know, so... Oh, don't so, compare well, I'm not, them. Well, I'm not, I'm not, don't I'm even not, compare. I'm not drawing a, nope. I'm not drawing an equivalence. I'm not drawing an equivalence. What I'm saying, <laughs> all I'm saying is that uh, different people occupy not, well, uh, different a spaces and on their... Like well, Hannity is, is, yeah, we, yeah. we, this is what... All, is. all discourse is welcome at the opening, so... Yeah. You, uh, <laughs> So, but yeah, yeah. one thought I thought is, if you start with, I'd like to write about Occupy, yeah, it conjures up a bunch of images, but mm -hmm. what if you, uh, or a bunch of opinions, right, but what mm -hmm. if you started with an image? What if you just didn't even tell people until the fifth or sixth paragraph that it's Occupy? That you well, actually I have 1,600 images at home. Well, I mean, actual verbal descriptions yeah. Yeah. of images without people getting that it's about Occupy. You pull them in, and they are having an experience of, of say, uh, somebody who's um, Moby Dick homeless, style. homeless, right. and uh, you know maybe uh, is drunk and is like yeah, down with Wall Street, right? And then you have somebody who's like a PhD and they're having this conversation, and you're telling this story, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't even know. But that's that it's, not at that all it's what it was like, though. So. Right. So then you would yeah. say, then you would say that. That's mm -hmm. like I was talking to this guy on this TV show, and he mm -hmm. said had this idea of what Occupy <laughs> was like, and you know what? He's totally wrong. Let <laughs> me tell you. So then all, all of a sudden, people are in. Well, what does she think? It's that, that's like but this then cliche. It's like, how do you want to convey the com the information to me? Because it's like if people already have a false impression, do I want to convey the information? You know, like I have that kind of a little bit of a quandary in my own mind. But I think that it is really cool to think about like. Like I said, the demographic that you're writing yeah. for, and just kind of educate people, or um, well, my answer maybe for you, even talk about yeah. a little bit. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, play is my answer to that. Mm. So you have this <laughs> yeah. quandary: how should I do it? Play mm -hmm. with lots of different options, right? Yeah. Have fun with it. Mm -hmm. Don't think about like, okay, is this going to work, or you know, is this a good comparison or not, mm -hmm. or you know, that's not what it's really, you know, just to like, just try lots of different options, mm -hmm. and then see what uh, what pleases you the most, because mm -hmm. basically. If it pleases you, it's going to please other people, not all other people, and yeah. then um, you're going to actually write something authentic as opposed to something for me. Uh, yeah, exactly. But you know, yeah. yes, you wanted to switch topics to the thing. Well, I was going to say we could talk about your book before okay. it's too late. Let's, if you sure. Let's to. give a little rundown. <laughs> uh, so, Andy here, you teach a class called Writing for the Subconscious. You also teach a class on life stories and yes, creative life. nonfiction. Yep. Uh, and you teach a book completion group. Book which completion sounds group. Sounds like that might be the class that I need to take because okay. I have lots of book fragments. And so this is one of the books I completed. This a is different a, kind of luxury. Yes, <laughs> Japanese lessons in simple living and inner abundance, Ooh. and it actually is about eleven people who live really rich, simple lives in the mountains of Japan, and they. This is based on your experience of actually living. I in Japan. lived there. Actually, the whole oh, book right. is translated from the Japanese. All the interviews were done in Japanese, and oh, I just cool. uh, I went to school here, and I wanted wanted to uh, at UCSC and graduated in 87 and we and my partner wanted to buy some land in the country here so we went to Japan just to teach and we met these people uh, who are living very very amazing lives really sustainably not kind of um, fake sustainably but 20 30 40 years with almost no money lots of time deep satisfaction so hmm. I was very moved to write about them do you think do you think it would be accurate to say that they live a lifestyle that is uh, it's similar to, say, a person who lived in Japan a few hundred years ago. Well, that's what I thought when I got there, and mm -hmm. they, they, they dispelled that they notion dispelled all the way. Right oh, away. Oh, isn't that interesting? Um, they do pull on different things uh -huh. that uh, come from Japanese traditional culture, but they don't live in the way, you know, in feudal Japan. Um, right. Many of them don't even, couldn't live in these old houses if the traditional village structure was still in place, but because lots of people left to the city, they can live in these old beautiful mm -hmm. farmhouses. But another thing that's super interesting about them, and I'll get back to Book Completion Group in a second, is they lived in India, they lived in Nepal, they lived in China. The oh, Japanese wow. people living in these other countries and pulling on Gandhian traditions of handwork oh, wow. or cool. pulling on uh, um, hand binding or uh, dyeing and weaving or pottery, and many of them are craftspeople. And they're basically putting together a life that seems to make sense for them, which is a quintessentially modern thing. Mm -hmm. 
isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, to you know, 200 years ago, you didn't have any choice on um, way to live. So mm -hmm. they basically, given the millions of choices we all have, what's mm -hmm. the most nourishing way to have a great life? Um, and I would even call it a way of life as opposed to a lifestyle, because a style kind of you know, implies a bit of a, you know, kind of a fashion. A lifestyle thing. is something that you could market to somebody. Yeah. yeah, but a way of life is something more deep. So to get back to book completion group, you know, how do you actually get to the end of finishing a book? How do you do that psychologically? How do you um, ignore all the thousands of distractions um, that are out there, all the fun things you could be doing instead of struggling with this sentence that you might cut later? And also, you know, the whole process of publication. I'm not a sort of how to get published and, you know, three <laughs> easy steps and become more famous than your brother, but I don't like that kind of writing mm. teaching class. But right. I do have the experience of publishing this book and also writing Open the Mind. So a lot of people said, hey, how do you do that? And so I developed this class where it's one on one coaching um, to help you through your process. You know, your process of writing your story right. it might be, it might not even be a book. Maybe mm -hmm. it's an article for you, right. and maybe it's a film script for you. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have different issues, and we meet one on one in a separate room while you have two and a half hours of in class writing time. So you get a sense. Oh. And then at the end, you have an hour and a half for everyone in the group, maximum seven people, to give feedback on what touched you emotionally, intellectually, what did it make you dream of, what did it make you remember, what did it make you think about, and if you wanted particular feedback on structure, like I'm putting these three fragments together, what did it make you think of to put these fragments together? You'd ask that to the group, and then you get five or six people plus myself feedback on where those leaps seem to be logical and interesting or which ones mm -hmm. left some people behind, mm -hmm. and other people said, no, no, I did get that, and, and by having the intellectual and subconscious feedback from everybody, you go home excited to do more writing. So it's back to that pleasure, fun base, like, let's enjoy it. How Sounds long wonderful. did these take? Um, to, to write the book, you mean? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I've been working, I've got like a lot of books working on, that I'm working on at the same time. I got a contract for writing Open the Mind in uh, 2004, and um, the press came to me, they saw one of my writing posters, and they said, we think you have a book, and so I, um, I wrote that, I think, in about uh, nine months, which was a little too fast. I'd like to have done it slower, because this, this is about the slow life. Um, and I had been working on this for a long time. This was a very slow book, because as I said, I was translating everything from the Japanese. And I am fluent in Japanese, but I'm not a you know simultaneous translator at all. And I really wanted to have the poetic feel, not just the sort of translation of the words from the Japanese, but the actual sense of that you were talking with these people. And I took once I got the contract for that, about uh, another year and a half or two to write it, but I've been really working on this book for 15 years when it finally wow. came oh, wow. out. Oh, so, that's amazing. So, um, but both because I really love the topic, so that's the you know, real reason for mm -hmm. um, writing a book, is because you really love doing it and enjoy it and want to share to other people. Now, my new project is the teacher training, so. How can um, somebody get in contact with you if they wanted to take a class, or do you have any availability? Yeah. Imagine you have a website. It looks <laughs> like I do yeah. have a website. <laughs> sure yeah. 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 Theopening.org. 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 Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, but I actually like the telephone. Mm -hmm. Give me a call. <laughs> uh oh. 831 728 831-728-9983. But I like to I give people free consultations on the phone about their writing, and they get a sense of how I work, which mm -hmm. is why I wanted to talk to you about your writing so that people could get a sense of, you know, the way I ask questions and mm -hmm. my presence. Mm -hmm. You just can't quite get that from an email. I welcome your email if you want to send an email to Andy <laughs> at theopening.org if that's easier or more comfortable right, right. for you. But I actually like to talk to nice people. Nice to have a face-to-face -face conversation, mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I've got um, Writing from the Subconscious starts on November 1st, and then we've got, um, it's Thursday afternoons, and uh, we have a book completion group in mid-December, as well as creative nonfiction in mid-December, and that's Thursday nights and Tuesday nights, respectively. Okay. Cool. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that sounds great. If you're in the Santa Cruz area or the uh, up in the Bay, up, uh, you should check that out. Check out Andy's work. So, yeah, this is, we, we've been talking to Andy oh, Cou Couturier. Couturier, <laughs> thank you. And uh, a, who teaches writing from the subconscious, Life Stories Creative Nonfiction Book Completion Group. He's the author of Writing the Open Mind and A Different Kind of Luxury. You've had your work published in The Writer Magazine and Adbusters in Creative Nonfiction, MIT Press, Japan Times, Kyoto Journal, The Oakland Tribune, 
And uh, just one last question to close yes. it out. I'm curious, what did you write for Adbusters, and what was that experience like? Uh, Adbusters uh, said that they were interested in people who were not uh, like uh, uh, consumerism in Japan. And uh, one of the people in the book I write about, um, I just decided to uh, pull this. It was actually before the book came out. But um, I wrote about how the Japanese characters, which come from the Chinese characters, mm -hmm. for consume um, is about extinguishing, like extinguishing a fire mm. to consume something. And then I painted a picture to, it. to kind of like, you know, wipe it out. And that that's what, and you know, it's an anti-consumer magazine. Yes. And so I said, I didn't want to just go to the easy route with the like physical objects that we buy, but just how we can even consume experiences. And I was in a mm. Japanese garden in Japan. There was this ton of tourists that were just sort of consuming mm, the garden, mm -hmm. and that was the first half of the article. And then, as opposed to having kind of a slower right, and this experience of really taking it all in and just yeah. like, oh, it's the, here's the latest stop on the tourism yeah. itinerary. So that was and then the first half of it. To the next place, right? And, yeah. And the second one was this guy who had uh, has he was a gardener and seed saver and heirloom. Um, you know, grew lots of heirloom plants, and he had this journal <laughs> where he was writing down the bloom dates of all of these plants oh, year yes. after year, <laughs> and just noticing it. And so he had all he had spent was you know money for the uh, pen and for the notebook, and he had had this deep connection with mm. the earth, just writing down the mm, dates mm -hmm. that they bloomed and watching mm. that over the years. And so I, awesome. oh. You know, that's really interesting because uh, I recently saw John Young, who's the author of a yes. book called What the Raven Knows, which uh -huh. is about bird behavior, uh -huh. and I was very inspired by his lecture. I went out and got a notebook and started jotting down, uh, anytime I'd see a bird around town, I did the location, the species of the bird, and the, the time of day, mm -hmm. and the particular behavior, what, what were they doing at that time uh, just to kind of start to get a sense of what their patterns mm -hmm. were and uh, lately you know I actually haven't been writing it down as much because uh, through the experience of that I feel very much in touch with what the birds around town are doing and I could tell you different parts of town different times of day um, oh yeah well at that time of day the black so the actual writing there. has deepened yeah. your experience of real life yes that's what we do great all right yay we're gonna give a shout out to the uh, writing teacher trainees are we done in time um uh, we can we can give a shout out here uh you want to maybe we could even look at this the camera is on this tripod you're on the show now hi everybody <laughs> <laughs> so this is Chris from the Yosemite area, Lillian from the Oakland area, over here in the orange chair, Norma from the Oakland area, and Kimberly from Santa Cruz, who is offering <laughs> classes for teachers in Santa Cruz. Thank you very much. Awesome. Okay, that's it. Thanks for watching the show. Bye, everyone.